Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. What a nice sunny day it is, isn't it? Amen. I like sunny days. They're so, so enjoyable to be out in. How many of you like mysteries? Oh, quite a few. All right. I have a mystery for you that has caused many people to be puzzled by it. And this isn't a long story. It's rather short. But listen carefully. Okay, here it is. When Enoch was 65 years old, he became the father of Methuselah. After the birth of Methuselah, Enoch lived in close fellowship with God for another 300 years, and he had other sons and daughters. Enoch lived 365 years, walking in close fellowship with God. Then one day, he disappeared, because God took him. The only commentary on this disappearance is found in one location in the New Testament. Here's the comment. It was by faith that Enoch was taken up to heaven without dying. He disappeared because God took him. For before he was taken up, he was known as a person who pleased God. And it is impossible to please God without faith. Anyone who wants to come to him must believe that God exists and that he rewards those who sincerely seek him. My concluding thought is that this event took place before the global flood of Noah's time. Enoch's son Methuselah died in the year that the flood was unleashed by God. And the condition of mankind by this time was that everything they thought or imagined was consistently and totally evil. And then I pause and I think, you know, this isn't much different from our current situation, is it? But Noah, like his ancestor Enoch, pleased God in spite of the evil all around him. And that's good. Okay, so Charlie, if you lead us in prayer, please. Lord, heads. our Heavenly Father, we're thankful for you and for your love. Dear God, we know that love is shown, dear God, by saving us and by you know, sending the Holy Spirit to dwell us and to go out and for fellow Christians. And as we're here this morning, dear God, help us to take advantage of that. And then later, as your servant brings the message, help us to open our hearts and our minds to what you'd like to talk to us and not be. I guess overcome by maybe some problems we have or other thoughts or all that. Bless our time together, each one that's here, that we go from here to God, help us to let others know about you and your love and salvation. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right, so the first hymn we're going to sing is number 759. So number 759. I like the title of it, What If It Were Today? Okay, so when you find your place at number 759, join me in standing.
Okay. Gary, go ahead and lead us. And all the veterans come up forward here, please. I'm missing a few. Come on out. Come on, old man. <laughs> Charlie, you always got the, the flag on. That's awesome. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Your veterans going on, that's awesome. Okay, uh, let's start off by sounding off the, the branch of the service and the years you served. Okay? U.S. Army, 1953 to 55. United States Army, 62 to 70. Whoop. Navy, Army, and National Guard, 83 to 2010. Wow. All right, now we're going to take and say the Pledge of Allegiance. That'll be all. Of I'll you rise. You guys smoke the grill. I don't have to tell you how to say it, but it's a About face, group, present arms. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Two. Once again, I'd like to give these guys a round of applause. Hold on a second, Denise has got something up her sleeve. Up her sleeve? Yeah, that's sleeve. <laughs> I sure do. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you. You can be seated. Hey, you don't know what it is. <laughs> thank you, Gary. <laughs> thank you for, that's a long time of service. Okay, announcements. If you got your prayer list and you turn it over, you'll see what I'm looking at. All right. Uh, shoebox assembling, uh, that was this coming Saturday at 11 a.m. There's still room on the roster to sign up if you'd like to come and help. So that's this Saturday. Uh, then a week from today is the luncheon after the morning service. Be sure and sign up. Uh, it's like potluck, isn't it? Everybody bring what they want? Yeah, they're trying to assist, yeah. Everybody brings yeah, what they want. Yeah. Okay, that's good. But be sure, whatever you bring, that you share it. Okay? <laughs> All right. And then the third thing on there is we're going to update the prayer chain. If you're not familiar with that, what that is is we have a, a phone participation as far as when prayer requests come up, sometimes they're labeled as urgent. And I think everybody knows urgent means act fast. So in that regard, we have people that are in the prayer chain means they're available by phone to be contacted to pray over the specific request. And we've done that for years, okay? And so we want to do an update of the prayer chain, update it again. And so those who are currently enlisted on the prayer chain, you have to do nothing. Okay, you will be on there and we will just reorganize it, but you're there so you don't have to do anything, you're included. But if you are new to this and you'd like to participate, you may, okay? And we require two things. One is your name and the second is a phone number by which you can be reached at any time, okay? Possibly. So a good current phone number along with your name and there's a sign up there. Uh, Doug Whitmore in the back, he'll sign your name up because it's way up high on the bulletin board. Right, Doug? It's way up high, okay? <laughs> so mainly all I need is your name and a current phone number, and then I'll be working on updating this. And when it's all updated and I'm done, everyone will get a sheet of the prayer chain who's participating so you know where you are on the list. And basically the way it works is that kind of works in an order to where a person above you receives the request, they relay it to you, and then you relay it to the person under you. And if you're at the bottom of the list, you have nobody to call, except you're just going to hear the request, okay? That's the prayer chain. So I don't think I have any more announcements, um, except it would probably be nice to have a nice prayer over uh, our veterans. That would be a good fitting way to uh, pray for them and stuff like that. So 
I will go ahead and lead in prayer for our veterans. Okay. Father in heaven, we're thankful for this time of year when we do turn our attention to those that have served so faithfully for our country. We realize that we would not have a country without those that serve. And so we are greatly uh, privileged and greatly thankful for these folks, for what they've done, the years in which they gave of their life to do what they could for the country. And so today we honor them and we do that gladly. We pray your blessing on those among us. We think of Gary and we think of Charlie and we think of Don and of course he couldn't be here today but we also think of Guy uh, as the ones that are amongst us that have served in the military. We pray your special blessing on them throughout today and tomorrow. We pray that they will feel uh, welcomed and they will feel uh, thanked uh, in a good way that encourages them. And we pray for those that are currently serving, that you'll continue to help them in the duty that they're performing for us all. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, our greeting hymn is going to be number 757. 757. And we're going to just sing the first verse only. And then we'll greet one another. All right? 757. Okay, so when you find it, join me in standing. <clears throat>
Um, on Sundays it's different. On Tuesdays when they go, they always actually have the But on Sundays they have the rest. So many people are there. Oh, depends on how it's not good. At least last week it wasn't. So it's the same thing we did. No, if it's just us, about six or five. study of First Thessalonians, I'm going to do a little bit of a summary, but we've learned about obstacles in the lives of these believers concerning the very things they were commended for. In their work of faith, the obstacle had become sexual purity. 
they were tempted to live like the pagans who lived around them. How? Well, the pagans indulged in sexual immorality because they don't know God and live with no control over themselves. And we as believers in Jesus have God's spirit to give us control over our physical desires. And we also live with the knowledge of God as to what pleases him and what doesn't please him. So we live by faith in Jesus Christ and not selfishly for ourselves. And then there was their labor of love. Their labor of love was beginning to show a selfish motivation instead of unselfishness toward others. Their lives were restless, leading to actions that didn't reflect love, such as an unhealthy preoccupation with the privacy of others, and depending on others for things they could do themselves, but would rather have others do it for them. Their testimony toward unbelievers would suffer if they kept acting selfishly like this, instead of showing genuine love. And then third, their patience of hope in the Lord Jesus Christ had been severely tested. And we might say, how? Well, this involved the deaths of those they held dear in the faith. Paul described their plight as being in much affliction. And if we recall, a believer named Jason had his house invaded, with everyone present being dragged out. Now, some of the very people that Paul led to Christ are dead. And in their sorrowing over these dead believers, they began to think about them missing out on what is to happen next when Jesus comes. And of course, if you're thinking that way, it only adds sorrow upon sorrow to the pain of their death. Their endurance is wavering due to this confusion about the future. And their question is, how will the coming of Christ affect those in the future who are now dead? I came here in the year 2000. And many of the people that greeted me at that time in 2000 have died too. And even some people since that time that came in after me have died too. What is their future situation going to be when Christ comes? Well, let's look for the answer in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Let's go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And we want to start by just looking at verse 13. And here's what the apostle writes. He says, But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. So the apostle makes two statements which stand as warnings to us who remain on earth in the faith. Okay, let's start with the first one. First warning, don't be ignorant. Don't be ignorant about what? Well, we'd say about the coming of Christ and all that is involved in this topic. And might I say, ignorance is not bliss when it comes to the issues of the death, the resurrection, and the coming of Jesus. In fact, the more you know will only cause your faith and assurance in Christ to grow stronger. Now, John the Apostle wrote a very interesting introduction to this topic of the coming of Jesus in Revelation. And here's what he wrote in that introduction. If you read this prophecy aloud to the church, you will receive a special blessing from the Lord. Those who listen to it being read and do what it says will also be blessed. For the time is near when these things will all come true. Now, this was written 
over 1900 years ago. So I would say it is even more true today about the time of the coming of the Lord being near. When you say so, 1900 years later. And we are blessed in knowing and in living by what God reveals to us concerning the coming of Jesus. What kind of impact can this knowledge have on a follower of Christ? Well, I want you to listen to John's answer to this question written at the end of the book of Revelation. Okay? Here it is. It's short and right to the point. He who has said all these things declares, yes, I am coming soon. And John's reply is, amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Now, it doesn't sound like John is upset or worried, does it? By that response. He sounds rather expectant about all this concerning the return of Jesus. And I think we should feel this way too, don't you? But there's a second warning right here in verse 13. And here's the second warning. Don't sorrow like unbelievers which have no hope over death. Lost people, if you've noticed, are given over to grief to the point that it controls them, that it paralyzes them, and that it consumes them. And this is often portrayed in our modern cinema productions. For example, there are two films that I saw concerning the death of loved ones, okay, made by modern cinema. And two very well-known actors played, one played in one film, one played in the other film. And in both of these situations, the main characters, this is what they did after losing their loved one. They both took their lives. That was how they dealt with the loss of a loved one. That's how it was portrayed in two modern films. And the question is, well, why do they act that way? And I think the simple answer is this. It's a result of what they have been taught and what they have believed all of their lives. What were these people living in Thessalonica, taught by their culture? Here's the answer. There is only hope for those who are alive, but not for those who have died. Once a man dies, there is no future. Upon an ancient tombstone in this region were written these words. Now think about this. I was not, I became, I am not, I care not. What an awful, awful end for anyone to consider for a loved one or even for oneself. Thoughts like these will drive you crazy with grief and sorrow. We, as followers of Christ, should not be consumed or controlled by grief over the death of of another follower of Christ, like unbelievers would do, according to the apostle. Now, here's the truth. We do weep, and we do grieve, but it shouldn't be to the level of hopelessness, like lost people. And we might say, well, why not? Well, here are some important reasons for us to consider, as expressed by the apostle. Let's, again, focus on his statement in verse 13 concerning those who have fallen asleep. A follower of Christ who dies is described as sleeping. Now I would like you to think about this next statement carefully. All right, listen, here's the statement. If I say in life that someone is sleeping, then what do I need? Here's what I need. I know where they are, and I know they are very much alive, even though they are out of sight. When I tell you someone is sleeping. Sometimes we panic over someone when they don't move. 
only to find out he really, oh, you know what? They were only sleeping. New parents can sometimes act this way concerning an infant who sleeps so soundly as to not move. And the parents are a little bit nervous. It's like, are they still alive? And, oh yeah, they are. Jesus spoke of two people on earth as sleeping when he actually knew they had died. One was a child. And he said, don't weep, for she is not dead but is only sleeping. Now, he knew where their child was, as with God, and that she was very much alive, where? In that location. At another time, Jesus said to his disciples that our friend Lazarus is sleeping, but I go that I may awake him out of sleep. When the disciples did not understand, then he said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. Again, he knew that Lazarus was with God and was very much alive in that location. What are these people who have died knowing Jesus? Where are these people who have died knowing Jesus and are buried in Thessalonica? Where are they? Here's the answer he gives in verse 14, that they are sleeping in Jesus. They are with Jesus and very much alive with him. And we might say, well, how can that be? And Jesus explains it with these words quite well. Anyone who believes in me, even though he dies like anyone else, shall live again. He is given eternal life for believing in me and shall never perish. We say, shall never die. So believing in Jesus means you experience eternal life when? Right now, the day that you believe and physical death becomes only a door to walk through toward an even better living than you have right now. I like that. Do you? That's good news. Well, if I'm alive after physical death, then why use the term sleep at all? I mean, I don't understand. Well, I think it is used for two reasons about those who have followed Christ on earth but died physically. Okay? Let's start with the first one. When the physical body is put down in the ground prostrate, then it is just as if it has gone to sleep. And the body will not move again until Jesus calls it from the grave to get up like he did with his friend Lazarus when he stood at his tomb. The body's down for a time until the resurrection planned for those in Christ. Like it's sleeping. Until Jesus calls and says, get up and come and the body will get up and go. But there's a second thought. And this second thought comes from the book of Hebrews. Now, listen to this, okay? Here's what we find in excerpt from the book of Hebrews. Although God's promise still stands, his promise that all may enter his place of, listen to the word, rest. We ought to tremble with fear because some of you may be on the verge of failing to get there after all. For this wonderful news, the message that God wants to save us has been given to us just as it was to those who lived in the time of Moses. But it didn't do them any good because they didn't believe it. They didn't mix it with faith. For only we who believe God can enter into his place of, here's the word, rest. He has said, I have sworn in my anger that those who don't believe me will never get in, even though he has been ready and waiting for them since the world began. So there is a full, complete rest, still waiting for the people of God. Christ has already entered there. He is resting from his work, just as God did after the creation. Let us do our best to go into that place of rest, too, 
being careful not to disobey God as the children of Israel did, thus failing to get in. Now, this illustration centers upon the children of Israel who came out of Egypt, but never made it to the promised land of Canaan due to unbelief. That generation was stuck in a hopeless existence of walking around in circles, in circles, in circles, until they died without ever getting to the promised land. When we depart from this world in physical death, then we are entering into a rest from the trials and the sufferings down here upon this earth. But we now enter into a different type of work. Apart from all the bad stuff, it is a restful experience for all of us in living up there and serving God in that place. Can you imagine what it's going to be like to serve God up there with all, all the things that drag me down? It means serving God will be a heavenly experience. Are you looking forward to that? Amen. I, I am too. How do we know that all of this information concerning those who have died in Christ is true? That's what unbelievers might ask us. How do I know it's true? Look at verse 14. Here's a very interesting thought. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. Now, this is true because, are you ready? Our Savior is the test case for all who believe in him. He's the test case. And we would say, well, what happened to Jesus? Well, here's a message which the Apostle Paul preached to his countrymen outside of Israel that answers this question quite well. This is a message that he preached. Here it is. The Jews in Jerusalem and their leaders fulfilled prophecy by killing Jesus. For they didn't recognize him or realize that he is the one the prophets had written about. Though they heard the prophets' words read every Sabbath, they found no just cause to execute him, but asked Pilate to have him killed anyway. When they had fulfilled all the prophecies concerning his death, he was taken from the cross and placed in a tomb. But God brought him back to life again, and he was seen many times during the next few days by the men who had accompanied him to Jerusalem from Galilee. These men have constantly testified to this in public witness. And now Barnabas and I are here to bring you this good news that God's promise to our ancestors has come true in our own time, in that God brought Jesus back to life again. And this is what the second psalm is talking about when it says concerning Jesus, Today I have honored you as my son. For God had promised to bring him back to life again, no more to die. This is stated in the scripture that says, I will do for you the wonderful thing I promised David. And in another psalm, he explained more fully, saying, God will not let his Holy One decay. This was not a reference to David, for after David had served his generation according to the will of God, he died and was buried, and his body decayed. No! It was a reference to another Someone God brought back to life whose body was not touched at all by the ravages of death. And now the apostle says, this same Jesus will come with all those who have died in faith since that time, being sent back with him by the God who raised him from the dead. Now, if I understand this right, if God can raise him from the dead, 
that he can certainly send all these with him when he returns. What do you think? Can he do that? Yes. He's God. But again, someone might say to me, but, but, okay, come on. What further proof is there to verify what I just heard from the apostle? And I would say, I'm glad you asked. Because I didn't want to stop there. Look at verse 15. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. If there is any uncertainty still remaining, then the apostle reveals what he was told firsthand by the Lord Jesus Christ on this topic. That's what he's saying. I heard this from the Lord, from his own lips. This is what he told me. What did he tell you? There's an order in which all of us in Christ become glorified involving our physical bodies. There's an order. And here's the good news. There is no disadvantage to experience physical death as a believer prior to the coming of Jesus. There is no disadvantage in that experience. Those in heaven now will not be the last in this order. Surprisingly, we that are alive physically at the coming of Jesus will not be first in the order of glorification. So they'll not be last and we'll not be first. And this event for all those in Christ, both living and dead, is going to happen quite rapidly. And we might say, well, how rapidly? The apostle writes in another letter, it will all happen in a moment, in the blinking of an eye. When the last trumpet is blown, for there will be a trumpet blast from the sky, and all Christians who have died will suddenly become alive with new bodies that will never, never die. Boy, that's fast. I mean, I'm standing up here, and how many times have I blinked my eyes? A hundred times, maybe? A thousand times? Again, the emphasis on the order is repeated. Look at verse 16. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise. Notice the word. First. First. I like this statement, that the Lord himself will initiate, initiate this coming for all of us. Don't you? I really like that. It reminds me of the times my mom stepped out on the front porch to call me home. And I was supposed to drop everything and come run. Is anyone old enough to remember those times? Huh? Oh, yeah. So I'm not the only one, okay? Come out on the porch and yell, and it's time to come run, okay? Now our attention turns to the fact that our Lord is shouting too as he comes. Isn't that interesting? And what is he shouting? Well, maybe it's similar to what he said at the tomb of Lazarus and telling him, come forth! I like that. And then the apostle says that his voice is similar to an archangel. Well, what does that mean to us? It's the voice of authority! with great power, giving a command which must be obeyed. And lastly, the apostle tells us the voice of the Lord is like a trumpet. It's a great voice, which means it can be heard everywhere with no child of God missing it. Now, if you're as old as me or older, maybe you'll identify with this. I can remember when my mom called me from the porch, if I didn't come as quickly as called by her, then she would add, I know that you heard me the first time. <laughs> Does that ever happen to any of you? 
Okay? I know that you heard me the first time. Well, if that was true of my mom, what's true of the Lord? We will hear it the first time. And this entire resurrection moment starts with those who are at home with Jesus receiving their resurrection bodies when? First. First. And my question then is, well, why? Why are they first? I really think it's their reward. Their reward for enduring physical death like he did in order to save them. And then those who are last but not least in the eyes of our Savior receive their reward. Look at verse 17. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Any of those remaining on the earth as believers in Jesus will be caught up like a tornado into the air, being transformed instantly. And folks, now, wrap your minds around this. The whole body of Christ in heaven and the whole body of Christ on the earth will stand around the Lord, united together completely for the first time in history. That's what's going to happen. The whole body of Christ will be united for the first time in history with the Lord in the clouds. And in reality, might I say to you, the greatest portion of the body of Christ is not on earth. But where is it? It's in heaven. Currently. The greatest portion of the body of Christ is in heaven. Right here, Lord. What a spectacle it will be to see Jesus coming with all of them to meet those who are alive on the earth. What a spectacle that will be. And the biblical term we use for this ascension of those of us on earth going up is this. It's the rapture. And it defines the idea of what? Being caught up. That's what it's meaning. Caught up. What is the best news about this gathering of all of us? Look again at verse 17. And thus... We shall always be with the Lord. Oh, wow. He has come from heaven to gather everyone together. So what comes next? It is his joy to lead us back into heaven for a celebration like you have never seen. Jesus said to his disciples on their last night together, Listen, let not your heart be troubled. You are trusting God. Now trust me. There are many homes up there where my father lives, and I am going to prepare them for your coming. And when everything is ready, then I will come and get you so that you can always be with me where I am. If this weren't so, I would tell you plainly, and you know where I am going and how to get there. And I would say in reply, yes, we do. By believing Jesus exactly as he told us to, right? We know where he is, and we know the way to get there. Hallelujah! So what should they do? And what should we do? For the present time as we wait for the return of Jesus for us. Look at verse 18. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. <laughs> I would say keep reminding ourselves that we are going to be part of a grand gathering involving everyone in Christ. 
No one in the faith will be absent. No one in the faith will be excluded. We should help the young to think about this. When what? When they are grieving. And even older ones too. We have so much to look forward to. We have so much to live for. And those dying in Christ will be first in line to receive their new body. And those of us alive will be at the back of the line. But here's the good news. All of us are going to get our bodies that fast. Amen. So you know what? I don't mind being in the back of the line because I know as soon as I'm in line, I get my body. And I'm happy for those that have gone on before me because they're first in line. They get their body. Isn't that wonderful? Doesn't that give us hope and joy that, hey, the best is yet to come as borrowed from our culture. The best is yet to come, and it's Jesus. He is the best. Hallelujah. Let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, as we come before you right now, we think about what we've had the opportunity to read this morning, and it's not been very long. It didn't require the apostle a whole sheet of paper to write this response but yet it's a powerful response. It's a powerful response concerning those believers in Thessalonica who were dreading and fearing over those that have gone on before them, wondering what will happen to these. And the good news is they won't be left out. They'll actually be first, first in line for what Jesus has in store. And the good news is, we who are still alive, when he comes, we've not experienced physical death, we won't be left out either. What great news that is. It, it gives me joy and hope in the midst of what we're living with all around us here on this earth. We're so thankful and grateful for this blessing to know your son is coming. He's coming for us. We can hardly wait. We would join John in saying, Amen. Come, Lord Jesus, come. It can't be soon enough. Thank you for this, for this hope that we have in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like you to go to hymn number 781. 781. is just sing the first and last verse. Just kind of looking for a hymn that would touch on seeing Jesus face to face, and there it was. Good hymn for us to sing. So when you find it, join me in standing, and again, we're going to sing the first and the fourth verse. <laughs>
Donald, if you lead us in prayer, we'll be dismissed. Lord, we come together to give thanks for the message of your love today that we have the joy within our hearts. I see and I feel the joy of all the people around me here today. And we thank you for that love that you instill in us. We come to you, Lord, and we ask you to open up the hearts of those who don't know you yet. Fill their heart with your love. Also, Lord, convict our hearts that they will ask you to commit their life to be their Lord and Savior and have that permanently in their hearts, and we thank you for that. We ask you also, Lord, to bless Israel, be with them. Bless the Israelites, Lord, and those who don't know you yet, let this be a time in their life also that they come and call upon your name and receive you into their life as their Lord and Savior. Again, Lord, I want to thank you for your love for this United States of America, and we thank you, Lord, for the election of uh, President Donald Trump, and be with him, protect him, Lord. Put your heads of love around him, that he will share with the countries around us, and again, they will come and want peace in you and in their lives, and we thank you for that. We thank you for all that you do with us and for us. We thank you for your love again, in your name.